Good evening. Hi, Bonnie. Good evening, Bonnie. <laughs> Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Immaculate Queen, pray for us. Saint Francis of Assisi, pray for us. Our holy guardian angels and patron saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. All right. So today we are going to begin at least the sacrament of penance. Um, last class we covered the Holy Eucharist, and of course penance is the other sacrament that we receive frequently or may receive frequently. Now, penance is one of just a couple of sacraments that we have the exact location or and, and time when our Lord instituted it, which of course was on the night, the evening of the resurrection, when he appeared to the apostles and he breathed on them and said, peace be to you, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So he instituted this sacrament. The catechism defines penance as a sacrament in which sins committed after baptism are forgiven by the absolution of the priest. And note, that it is sins committed after baptism. Because if you have a case of someone who is baptized, let's say as an adult, uh, let's say a person is 25 years old and he or she is baptized, then baptism not only takes away original sin, but also all actual sins or personal sins that that person had committed. And so there would be no need to ever confess those sins that were committed before baptism, then wiped away with baptism. So again, penance is a sacrament in which sins committed after baptism are forgiven through the absolution of the priest. Now, uh, the Council of Trent defines baptism uh, with an interesting term. The Council of Trent used the term that baptism is a second plank after shipwreck. So think of mariners, sailors on a ship that is lost at sea, that hits a reef or whatever, and, and the ship is breaking apart, and these sailors have to fend for themselves, and so here they are in the water, and they look around for a plank to grab onto that will help them stay afloat until they can be rescued or whatever. So uh, mortal sin, is the shipwreck of the soul. And penance is that opportunity to be saved from drowning uh, through this wonderful sacrament. Um, what are the words the priest uses? The What we would call the form of the sacrament. The priest would say uh, the, the main part, I absolve thee from thy sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now the full form that the priest says is several times longer than that, but that's the that's the main uh, part of the form of the sacrament of penance. One of the things that I found, and in fact I've been speaking to a man about this, um, who uh, is a non-Catholic, and one of the things you find is that this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for non-Catholics. And when I was talking to this man about the faith, pretty much everything else he could accept, even, even devotion to Mary, which is also oftentimes a problem for Protestants. 
But he says, I just can't see telling my sins to a man, is the way he described it, telling my sins to a man. And I've spoken to a number of converts who were converts as adults, and they mentioned that it was a difficult thing for them to do. Now, of course, children who are raised in the faith and get into the habit of frequent confession from the time they're very young, it's not difficult at all. But for converts who are converted as adults, this is a very difficult thing to do. Now, of course, it's a, an embarrassing thing for one to admit his sins. But we find that God required that even in the Old Testament. Uh, when Eve, Adam and Eve sinned, and Eve, uh, well, God first went to Adam and, and said, what have you done? And Adam said, well, yes, I ate the fruit, but the woman gave it to me. Then God went to Eve and said, what have you done? And, well, I ate the, the fruit, but the serpent deceived me, etc. So they kind of, in a way, excused themselves, but the fact remains that God compelled them to admit their sin. Same thing in other cases in the Old Testament. Cain killed his brother Abel, and God said, what have you done? And there was a certain sort of confession even in the Mosaic Law, because there were certain sacrifices that had to be offered for certain sins. So by the person going to the priest and saying, I, I need to offer this sacrifice, they were acknowledging their sins. That's um, something taken from the wonderful book on confession called The Sinner's Return to God by Father Michael Mueller, in which he brings out the, so to speak, the history of confession of sin in the Old Testament. Now it's very interesting that even non-Catholics acknowledge the value of this, this idea of confession. Uh, and the, um, what are they, the 12 steps that Alcoholics Anonymous uses and other, other organizations for that. The fifth step is a sort of confession. They find someone that, that they feel they can talk to, a good friend, and they have to, um, so to speak, unload their uh, misdeeds of their lives. And I know that because once, quite a few years ago, a man called me and he wanted me to give a talk. It ended up not happening. But to his group, because they were about to go through the fifth step, and he thought, well, a Catholic priest can help them understand the value of that fifth step of confessing uh, their sins. So, of course, what they do, it's not the same as sacrament of confession, but it is a sort of acknowledgement, admission of what I've done wrong and what I need to amend. The sacrament of penance is a, a blessing because, again, it gives a person the opportunity who's fallen into mortal sin to have his sins forgiven, to get, so to speak, a new fresh start, and it also is an opportunity for grace because it's one of the sacraments. So what are the effects of a good confession, of receiving the sacrament of penance worthily? The first effect is the restoration of sanctifying grace if it was lost through a mortal sin, or an increase of sanctifying grace in the event that it was not lost through a mortal sin. That's the first effect. Second, the forgiveness of sins, obviously. Third, the remission of the eternal punishment if necessary. So if a person had committed mortal sin, he has, so to speak, hanging over him this sentence of eternal punishment. And that sentence is wiped away by a good confession. That um, sentence of eternal punishment is remitted, forgiven and also a part, at least, of the temporal punishment due to sin. Now, this idea of what we call the temporal punishment due to sin deserves a second class, a class in itself. So we're going to cover that next week. So just like we did with Holy Communion or the Holy Eucharist, we used two classes because we had to go through the Mass as well as the Holy Eucharist. So likewise, with penance, it will take two classes to cover uh, adequately, or at least in a basic way, today concentrating on penance and confession, and then um, 
Next week we'll talk, continue on confession and talk about what do we mean by temporal punishment and, and what are indulgences, which ties in with that same topic. So the third effect of penance again is the remission of the eternal punishment if necessary and also a part, at least, of the temporal punishment due to sin. Fourth effect of this sacrament worthily received is the help to avoid sin in the future. So it strengthens us, in other words, against temptation. Helps us to avoid sin in the future. And finally, the restoration of the merits of our good works if they have been lost. So we talked about merit way back several months ago when we had the lesson on grace. Because every good work that is performed in the state of sanctifying grace earns merit. And merit is a right to a reward. The amount of merit that we have at the moment of death, which is based on all the sacrifices we've made, all of our prayers, all the sacraments we receive, all the works of charity, etc. Any good deed done in the state of grace and done with the right intention gains merit. And the amount of merit determines, determines our place in heaven. But what a, what a sad thought to think that by one mortal sin, a person loses all the merit he acquired over many years. But a worthy confession receiving the sacrament of penance, those merits that have been lost by mortal sin are all restored to the soul. So that is a, a comforting thought. Um, the sacrament of penance also gives us the opportunity to get advice from the priest. Sometimes a person will have certain things to confess, but also maybe doubts or a need for advice. And when that is the case, don't hesitate to take advantage of that opportunity. For advice. Now, what must we do to receive the sacrament of penance worthily? And you probably remember in, with your children, your grandchildren, in a little catechism, they usually show a hand because it's five things. And you go through the five things to make a good confession or to receive the sacrament worthily. So the first thing is an examination of conscience. We have to think, we have to spend some time calling to mind. What do I need to confess? Uh, and that's why we have those cards, those laminated cards at the church that I, I got from the bishop that have on one side how to go to confession, in other words, what to say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, etc. The one side, it tells you the, you know, the form to say. And on the other side, it goes through the Ten Commandments and has at least a general examination of conscience because you can read through it and say, okay, yes, I did this, no, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, oh, here's another one that I need to confess. So it, it's an aid for someone to do this. But to make a good confession, we first of all, we can't just simply go right in and, and say what, what comes to our mind. We have to spend some time thinking, examining our conscience ahead of time. The second thing is to confess our sins to the priest. So I'm going to put it this way, to tell our sins. Now, um, again, as I mentioned about this man I've been talking to, that's a difficult thing for some people. And what we need to help them understand is that, well, first of all, a priest has heard many, many confessions, uh, likely if he's been a priest even for a couple of years, thousands of confessions. And so it's not that he's going to hear something from you that he hasn't heard before, likely. But furthermore, by hearing so many confessions, a priest forgets what he hears. In fact, St. Augustine had that saying, a famous saying of St. Augustine, many famous sayings by St. Augustine. But one of them, them, he said, what I know from confession is less known to me than if I did not know it at all. So you think about that as kind of a consolation. He said, what I know as a priest, he's saying, through confession, through hearing and confession, is less known to me than if I didn't know it at all. What does he mean by that? The priest forgets what he says. Now, I might point out here, let's say you have a person who lives in a parish, as we do, where you have the same priest as you have had for many years, and you think, he will probably recognize my voice. 
probably recognize me, or there's a good chance he will. And, you know, I have something really bad to confess. You feel really um, nervous about confessing. Holy Mother Church allows the faithful to go to any priest. And in fact, every now and then, we have a, an outside priest come to the parish. So you have a, a different priest. You have that opportunity. Or you can go to Mount St. Michael. And in normal times, when you had a lot of churches in a city of any given size, you know, you could just go to any church you wish and go to confession to a priest that had no idea who you were. Uh, so the church gives you that, that opportunity when a person would feel uh, otherwise very difficult for that person to make his confession. But again, keep that in mind. You're confessing to God. You're confessing to our Lord, whose place is taken by the priest. And the priest is obligated under what we call the seal of confession, never to reveal anything he hears in confession, uh, not even to allude to it. In fact, sometimes I already had a sermon prepared for Sunday. And then I'm hearing confessions before Mass, and somebody confesses something that's exactly what I was going to talk about in the sermon, then I will usually say, and by the way, I was going to be speaking about that. So they don't think that when I give the sermon, oh, he's giving that sermon. <laughs> 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 so, confession, you know. um, so, um, so I will I will say that, you know, just so that removes that. And it's also happened where I hear something and then decide not to cover that which I was going to cover in the sermon and decide just not to do it, just so that there is no, uh, what we often refer to as the onus, there is no onus for the person that makes it more difficult for him, uh, thinking that, oh, maybe the priest is, you know, using some information. You know, the uh, the uh, theologians, when they talk about the seal of confession, they say there's one way the priest can use the knowledge. And that is to help him strive more for holiness. That's the way the priest can use it, to humble himself and to, to realize his duty of striving more for holiness. Okay, so that's the second thing, and we're going to come back to that later, either later today or, or next week, the, the qualities of a good confession, I mean, how we confess, uh, and what must be confessed. So we'll come back to that. The third thing is very important, and this topic is so important that it has a separate lesson in a typical catechism, and that is contrition for sin. Now, of course, contrition is another word for contrition is sorrow. So we're going to we're going to cover that one today in much more detail, um, and then the idea of the telling of the sins will probably probably have to put that off till next week. So sorrow, of course, is essential for forgiveness. Uh, there's an old saying, without contrition, there is no forgiveness. There can be no forgiveness for any sin if the person is not sorry for that sin. And in addition to contrition, the next point, which has a separate number but really goes together with contrition, is the purpose of amendment, a firm purpose of amendment, which means the determination not to commit the sin again. And I say they go together because if a person is really sorry, really sorry, then he's going to try not to commit that sin again. He's going to be determined not to commit it again. Because if a person doesn't have that purpose of amendment, he didn't really have sorrow. But there, there are two elements here that are very important. And the last thing is, I'll just use, because I'm using just simple words here, you know, not, not going on in detail. Uh, the word satisfaction, which, he, which means making up. And we think of it as doing the penance the priest gives us. So performing the penance, which is making atonement or satisfaction for the sins we've committed. So those are the five uh, requirements for a good confession to receive the sacrament of penance worthily. Um, and uh, let's move on then to, to contrition. The one thing I want to say about the examination is it's a lot easier to do if you are in the practice, as we all should be, of making a nightly examination of conscience before you retire. 
part of your night prayers. You think about what you have done wrong that day, and then you say the act of contrition. And so if you do that every day, then when it comes time to go to confession, you know, every week or every couple weeks, it's a lot easier to make that examination because you've been doing it every day, and you will call to mind what should be mentioned. All right, so we want to now really hone in on contrition. And it's interesting that contrition comes from a Latin word contemere, which means to grind into powder, like to crush. Think about having a substance where it just ground down. Because if a person is sorry, it's like his heart is being ground down by this grief, by this sorrow. Um, and of course, our sorrow can have a lot of degrees. You know, someone may be more sorry than someone else. But the degree of our sorrow will determine the other thing that I had here, the amendment. The, if a person is, he is sorry, but maybe not as sorry as he or she could be, that person is not going to strive to amend to the same degree that someone else who has a deep sorrow will do. So um, contrition is very important. And when we talk about contrition, We'll use the word um, true contrition. And that means, let me give you an example of a false contrition, or one that would not remit sin. Um, a person commits a sin, which also happens to be a civil crime, like robbing somebody, and gets caught. Now he's sorry, because he has to go to jail. Not because of what he did, but because he got caught. And a good example of that from Scripture would be Judas. It says in Scripture, he repented, right? He repented, and he went back to the chief priest, and he threw the money in the temple that he wanted so badly before he betrayed our Lord to get that money. And now it, like, he, he hated it. He didn't want it. He took it back. And it says he repented. But he didn't repent to the point of obtaining forgiveness. He was sorry he did it because he felt bad. And he knew he drew upon himself the execration of the, of the apostles. They looked upon him as what he was, a miserable traitor. And so he was very sorry, but it wasn't true contrition. So for contrition to be true contrition, it must have certain qualities. And we usually list four qualities interior, supernatural, uh, supreme, and universal. So let's just understand what we mean by those. And now this doesn't mean, you know, every time you're going to make an act of contrition, every time you're sorry for your sins, okay, now is it into it? Is it, you know, to go through them? Because I'm sure that, that a person who really is sorry for his sins has these. But it's by looking at them that help us understand better what contrition is. So true contrition is, first of all, interior, means it comes from the heart, the mind and the heart. It's not just words. and not just saying I'm sorry. It comes from inside. Second, it's supernatural. And that's like the example I told you of the man who robs somebody and gets caught, and now he's sorry because he's going to go to jail. That's a natural sorrow, not a supernatural sorrow. It is sorrow. He regrets doing it because of the time he has to spend behind bars, but it's not a supernatural uh, sorrow. Uh, so that's what we mean. Supernatural means it's based on a supernatural motive. And there could be several good supernatural motives. One very good motive is, I don't want to go to hell. I'm sorry for my sins because I don't want to go to hell. It's a very good motive. Not the best, but very good. Another person might have, so I'm sorry because my sins cause the passion and death of Christ. My sins caused him to suffer. Or I am sorry because God is so good and it's such a terrible ingratitude to offend him who has done nothing but good for me. How could I be so ungrateful uh, to offend my greatest benefactor? So you see, there are different, different motives that are all supernatural. Supernatural means that the motive is based on faith. 
a truth of faith, why a person is sorry. Not because of some natural motive. Well, I'm sorry because now people don't like me because of what I did, or something like that. That would be a purely natural motive and would not obtain forgiveness. So interior supernatural, now supreme, means that we must detest mortal sin above every other evil in the world. It is the greatest evil in the world. And so we must detest it above everything else. Supreme means highest, above everything else. And lastly, universal means that a person who has true contrition must have contrition for at least all mortal sin. Now, a person could have a venial sin. Let's say this person is attached to a certain grudge against someone else and that isn't willing to give up that grudge. And that's a venial sin. And the person is not forgiven because he, does, he or she doesn't have the sorrow for that. He's not willing to give it up. But the person is sorry for all of his mortal sins. Then that would be true contrition. So we're talking about universal means all mortal sins. So a person is sorry for all mortal sins. And that's essential to have true contrition. Now, I, I put that word up there, true contrition, you know, to distinguish it from a natural sorrow, a natural regret. But when it comes to true contrition, there are two kinds of true contrition. One is called imperfect, and the other is called perfect. And the distinguishing point between them is the motive behind the sorrow. So imperfect contrition is sorrow based on fear, namely of God's just punishments. Everlasting punishment in hell or and or punishment in purgatory, perhaps for many years, to atone for sin. So that's based on a fear, and that's a good thing, but it's not perfect. Perfect contrition is based on the love of God. And it's a good thing to have both. And in fact, when we say the act of contrition, and we mean it from our hearts, we give expression to both. Because we say, oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee. And I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. That's imperfect contrition. That's based on fear. Other, another form is, uh, I detest all my, I, because, because of thy just punishments. You know, I'm sorry, and I detest all my sins because of thy just punishments, or the loss of heaven, the pains of hell. But then the act of contrition goes on to say, but most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And that is the perfect. So if you say the act of contrition and you think of the words and you mean them, you have given expression to both motives, and that's wonderful. Now, uh, imperfect contrition has another name for it. It's also called attrition. And you don't need to know that, which is a little tidbit. But imperfect contrition is adequate for sins to be forgiven in the sacrament of penance but not outside the sacrament of penance. So we say that an act of perfect contrition wipes away sin, even the guilt of sin, even outside of confession, even before the person goes to confession. Now, the person still must confess. That's a law of God, that one must still go to confession. But in the meantime, he is able to recover the state of sanctified grace by an act of perfect contrition, which is a wonderful thing, a very consoling thought. And that's why we should be in the habit of saying the act of contrition devoutly every night before we retire, part of our night prayers, and to say the words slowly, think of the words, and mean them. Um, again, imperfect is adequate for the sacrament of penance, but we should always strive to have both the motive of fear and the motive of love of God. So it says here, uh, when is sorrow for sin true contrition? Sorrow for sin is true contrition when it is interior, supernatural, supreme, and universal. 
and then the book goes on to, uh, the catechism goes on to explain those, so I think we've adequately covered that. Um, so what I was just saying about perfect contrition, I'll read this one question. How can a person in mortal sin regain the state of grace before receiving the sacrament of penance? A person in mortal sin can regain the state of grace before receiving the sacrament of penance by making an act of perfect contrition with the sincere purpose of going to confession. So this person has to have the intention of going to confession because that's part of that perfect contrition, doing what God requires, confessing the sin. Um, it can happen that, uh, and, and I've had this situation with me before, where I went to a hospital, to a sick person's room, and the person wants to receive the sacraments, but there's other people around, and there's no way to get privacy. And so I tell the person, think of your sins, and I'll give you absolution, but you must be ready and willing and resolved to confess those sins when you have the opportunity, if you recover. Because this is where a person is going to receive absolution. You know, the person may be in danger of death, but there's no possibility of having a private confession. So, of course, the person is not to confess his or her sins, and so the priest would uh, instruct the person, go through the act of contrition, make sure the person has sorrow, true sorrow, but the sins could be forgiven with the absolution, which is then given, as long as the person has the resolve to confess them when he has the opportunity. So, um, perfect contrition uh, includes that determination to confess them. Now, what if you make an act of perfect contrition? Someone has a, fallen into mortal sin. This person makes an act of perfect contrition. That person could not go to Holy Communion without going to confession first. Why? Well, first of all, because that's a requirement of the church. But second, you never know for sure, for certain, that your act of contrition was really perfect. You think that you, had, you, you did have true and perfect contrition, but you can't be sure. So you have to go to confession first before receiving Holy Communion. But it's a wonderful consolation to know that an act of perfect contrition will restore the life of sanctifying grace. Uh, so, it, so it goes on to say in the Catechism, what should we do if we have the misfortune to fall into mortal sin? If we have the misfortune to commit a mortal sin, we should ask God's pardon and grace at once, make an act of perfect contrition, and go to confession as soon as we can. We may not receive Holy Communion after committing a mortal sin. If we merely make an act of perfect contrition, one who has sinned grievously must go to confession before receiving Holy Communion. And then it ends with this section, with explaining the purpose of amendment. So remember we were saying contrition is sorrow for sin, and if it is true sorrow, it includes the firm purpose of amendment, which means the resolve not to commit sin again. It flows from contrition. The firm purpose of sinning no more is the sincere resolve not only to avoid sin as far as possible in the future, but also to avoid the near occasions of sin. So let's just take a moment. We did talk about that back when we covered uh, mortal and venial sin. We covered sin after we covered original sin, then we go on to actual sin. But um, this, this idea of the near occasions of sin means any person, place, or thing which would strongly tempt us to, to commit sin. That if we placed ourselves in that occasion, we very likely would fall, or very possibly would fall. So the purpose have to, has to include the resolve to avoid that occasion. So let's say you have a person who just has a real problem with alcoholism, and he goes to the bar every day after drink, after work and drinks, and he gets drunk. And then he finally he's repentant, he goes to confession. His act of contrition is not sincere. 
if he does not have the resolve to stay away from that bar, that place where he goes, where he drinks. That, for him, is an occasion of sin. So true sorrow would be the resolve to stay away from that occasion. And that would apply to any, any other occasion of sin. Now it says, if a person has only venial sins to confess, uh, what kind of purpose of amendment must he have? If a person has only venial sins to confess, he must have the purpose of amendment of avoiding at least one of them to be able to receive the sacrament of penance. Because again, that idea of universal contrition means true sorrow for all mortal sin. It must, which is absolutely essential. But it is possible, obviously not something that's good, but it's possible for a person that hasn't given up a venial sin, maybe a certain, like I said, a grudge or you know, dislike of someone that hasn't given that up, could still go to confession. If it's a venial sin, and the person has true sorrow for all mortal sin, and other venial sins, the person could still go to confession all right, and receive forgiveness of the other sins. But that one would not be forgiven, that venial sin, if the person doesn't have sorrow for it. Um, we have enough time. I'd like to go into now confession. I wasn't sure if I'd get to this today or put it off till next week, but let's cover it today. And this is, you know, usually when we refer to this sacrament, we say, I'm going to confession. Or I receive, sometimes those are the sacrament of confession. Well, it, it, confession is not a sacrament. The sacrament is the sacrament of penance. But confession means the telling of our sins to the priest, which if you remember from the five things, that was the second one. You know, examine our conscience, and then we go into the confessional, and we tell our sin. Well, how are we supposed to do that? The confession of sins, to be a good confession, must have certain qualities. I'll start by the preliminary questions and answers, reading through those, and then we'll go on to those uh, qualities of confession. Confession is the telling of our sins to an authorized priest for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness. Why must we confess our sins? We must confess our sins because Jesus Christ obliges us to do so in these words spoken to the apostles on the evening of his resurrection. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. That power was meant to be transmitted by the apostles to their successors in the priesthood, bishops and priests' successors. Um, these words of Christ oblige us to confess our sins because the priest cannot know whether he should forgive or retain. Retain would be to not forgive our sins unless we tell them to him. Is it necessary to confess every sin? It is necessary to confess every mortal sin which has not yet been confessed and forgiven. It is not necessary to confess our venial sins, but it is better to do so. Some people in confession even wish to confess their temptations, if they've been struggling with the temptation, even though they don't believe they gave any consent for the grace of overcoming that difficulty, they admit it, they confess it. It's not a sin, but they acknowledge it. Reminds me of the story in one of these books on the religious life, there was this monk. And this is back in the days when they lived kind of like hermits and different huts, and they, they would come together into a common chapel for prayer, but they lived in their huts. And there he was in his hut, and he was being tormented with the temptation to leave the religious life and go back to the world. And it was just so strong, and he was just about to leave, etc. And he's going through this, and it was just like torture, you know, this temptation to return to the world and leave his vocation. And finally, he resolved, I'm going to go to the superior and tell him what I'm going through. And he got up, and as he was on his way to tell the superior, it's like all the clouds parted, and that temptation was totally gone. Well, he still went to the superior, and he told him that. And he said, well, you should have come sooner, because by coming and that act of humility, of acknowledging the temptation you were going through, by, by confessing it, even though you didn't commit a sin, but you were having this 
strong temptation by confessing it, you're humbling yourself, and you're thereby receiving the grace to overcome it, and that's why there's temptation left. You know, they say the devil likes darkness. It's kind of like, you know, if you pick up a rock and there's little creatures under the rock, they scatter as soon as the light is there, and the devil likes things to be in darkness. He doesn't like them confessed. He doesn't like them acknowledged or admitted to. Um, now, so the chief qualities of a good confession are that it must be humble, sincere, and entire. So humble means that the attitude of the person confessing his sins, his attitude is one of, I am a sinner. And that's what we say at the beginning of confession. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. So it's like the confidior at the beginning of Mass. And the priest stands at the foot of the altar, and he bows over deeply and says the confidior. And what he says is, I confess to Almighty God, Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Michael, you know, go through the saints, and you, brethren. You know, he acknowledges, to the servers are the ones that respond, but he is confessing or acknowledging to everyone in the church, I am a sinner. So that uh, prayer and that act of humility is required by the church before the priest begins Mass. And it's a preparation for Mass to acknowledge our sinfulness before the priest dares to ascend the altar and continue with the Mass. So humility is so important. Like it says in Scripture, God resists the proud, but gives his grace to the humble. So if a person went into confession and told a sin, but then blamed it on someone else, yeah, I did this, but it's because she said this, or they did this, or whatever, you know, that's a lack of humility. It's a lack of owning up to the person's guilt in, in having done that. So we want to make sure that we have that quality of humility. Our confession is humble, and it's sincere. And the best way to explain sincere is to use some synonyms. So frank, straightforward, honest, uh, all of those would, would convey this idea, what do we mean by sincere? It's a very interesting et etymological uh, origin of the word sincere, because it comes from the Latin words sine cera, which means without wax without wax, because they used to, one of the ways they would make statues and things is they would use wax, and then once the, the wax was peeled away or melted away, then you had the likeness there of the statue or whatever it was. So it was a sincere image of, you know, the person or whatever, with, without the wax. I don't know exactly how they did that, but I, that's, that's where the word comes from. I just thought that was interesting, without wax. But what is sincere? You think of it as honest. You know, if somebody is sincere, you know that that person is telling you what he believes to be the truth. And so that would be a good way of describing it. We tell the priest what we have done as we believe it to be in the eyes of God. Now this is something, this would not be true humility for a person to pretend he's worse than he is. You know, to, to exaggerate his sin. More than what's there, thinking, well, that's humility. No, humility is truth. So we, when we speak of sincere, are to confess our sins as we believe them to be in the eyes of God. Not exaggerating, and especially not appreciating, not trying to hide it. You know, parents know this very well. Children do something wrong, and you call them on the carpet for it, for it and there's always these explanations and excuses and trying to trying to explain, well, what did you really, what happened? You know, of course, every child uh, coming into this world with original sin on his or her soul is going to try and put all the blame on his brothers and sisters and, you know, and make himself or herself look like, well, maybe I did a little bit thing wrong, but, you know, but leave, leave out details, right? Mm -hmm. Leave out important details. Uh, they'll tell you some of what happened, but leave out details. That's human nature, fallen nature. But when we go to confession, that's the time to be completely honest and open with what needs to be confessed. So straightforward. And entire means it must include at least all mortal sin. 
So if a mortal sin were left out, or an important aspect of a serious sin were left out, then it would not be an entire confession. Well, let's get to that, that point then. What must be confessed? Um, we must confess, must confess at least all mortal sins. Again, venial sins, it's good to do so, but there's no obligation. And when we speak of mortal sins, we must say, I'll use the word name of the sin. In other words, what is it? What's the name of the sin? What is the sin? Second, how many times it was committed? And third, any circumstances, if there are any, that would change the nature of the sin. And a simple example that's sometimes used is if you stole $20, that's one thing. $20, a theft of $20 would not be normally a mortal sin. But what if somebody stole that same $20 from a destitute person? That changes the nature. That is circumstances that makes it very different. Now it is a mortal sin because this was taken from someone who's destitute. And maybe that's everything the person owes or, or a lot of it. So um, that would just be a, an example of what we mean by any circumstances that would change the nature. And another way of saying is that if there are circumstances which if the priest knew, he would understand, oh, this is a very different thing than what I first thought it was. Maybe that's a way to explain it. However, when we use that word circumstances, the confessional is not the time and the place for a person to go on and on with details. It's not the place for details or telling a story how this came about, you know, some narration. It, it really, I mean, confession should take two or three minutes. That's it um, for everything, uh, unless the person is, needs to get advice. Because it doesn't take that long to say that if the person made the examination of conscience, what are the sins, if it, they're mortal, how many times, and if there are any circumstances which would change the nature of the sin. But if there are, then that, that doesn't even need to be brought in. And uh, by the way, venial sins, it's also a good idea to confess a number of times, but it's not obligatory, because confession of venial sin is not obligatory in confession. However, uh, there must be matter for confession. And so if a person confessed only faults and failings that did not amount to venial sins, a priest could not give absolution, because there's no matter for the confession. But you can always confess past sins that um, occurred after baptism. Remember what we said at the beginning of this class, confession is only for sins that were committed uh, after baptism. Because if a person were baptized as an adult, he should never confess sins committed before baptism. So um, that's why it is a good idea and I mentioned those cards we have at the church for confession. You know, it starts off what you say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was three weeks ago, whatever it was. So this is my first confession, uh, whatever. And then you confess your sins. And then at the end of your confession, you say, I am heartily sorry for these and all the sins of my past life. And that would be enough for matter. But usually it's a good thing to say, I'm heartily sorry for these and all the sins of my past life, especially sins of, you know, if a sin, a person has a, had a particular sin or a group of sins, especially all of my sins of disobedience or of, of you know, dishonesty, whatever. And a person could do a different one each time. But that's to make sure of two things, that there is true sorrow, because if a person confessed venial sins and maybe maybe didn't have this real sorrow for them. That would be an issue. But the second reason is to make certain that there is matter for the absolution, matter for the sacrament. Okay, um, I just want to run through this, look through this um, part on confession, the idea of confession, to see if there are any other little things that goes through, humble, sincere, entire. Uh, what are we to do if we forget, through no fault of our own, we forget to confess a mortal sin. 
you have a person who did plan on confessing it, and maybe goes into confession, and maybe has several mortal sins, and he confesses the ones that, you know, are uppermost in his mind, and maybe he's pretty nervous, it's not going to be easy to make this confession, and he forgets a mortal sin through no fault of his own, human weakness, human nature, forgot to confess it. And then he gets out of the confessional, and sometime later, maybe right after he gets out, or sometime later, he remembers it. Oh, I was supposed to confess such and such. What does he do? And it says, if without our fault we forget to confess a mortal sin, we may receive Holy Communion because we have made a good confession, and the sin is forgiven. But we must tell the sin in confession the next time. Now, that's, again, presuming that the person resolved to confess it. He was planning on confessing it. And maybe with the other things he had to say, he just forgot it. But he, he, did, he did have the determination to confess it. Um, if a person knowingly conceals a mortal sin in confession, the sins that he confesses are not forgiven. Moreover, he commits a mortal sin of sacrilege. So this is when a person knowingly conceals a mortal sin or maybe there are certain circumstances where, without mentioning those, the priest thought it was a menial sin. But by him knowing those circumstances, he realizes it's more serious. And the person didn't say that. So that would be a bad confession. And then the person, even though he may have confessed other mortal sins, the next time he goes to confession and he's going to repair that bad confession, he would have to confess all the serious sins committed since his last good confession. Um, not, just, not just the one that he failed to confess. Uh, what must a person do who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin? Well, it just goes into that. A person who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin in confession must confess that he made a bad confession, tell the sin that he concealed, and mention the sacraments he has received since that time, and confess all the other mortal sins he has committed since his last good confession. Now, you know, a person should never be alarmed. Uh, there, there's always a solution. It might be difficult because a person has to admit, you know, I made a bad confession, whatever, but it can always be repaired with a good confession, and that's where a priest could help the person, you know, to say, now what must I do? I did this, or whatever. And the priest would help the person to make a good confession. Uh, a, a next, a couple more questions, so I'll just finish with these. A sense of shame and a fear of telling our sins to the priest should never lead us to conceal a mortal sin in confession because the priest who represents Christ himself is bound by the seal of the sacrament. I guess I erased the word, but we had it up there. We talked about that earlier. The priest is bound by the seal. It is a very, very serious obligation. And the priest can never, never um, reveal what he told in confession uh, to anyone. The priest couldn't even go up to you if nobody else was around so nobody could hear and say, you know, when you mentioned this to me in confession, I forgot I was going to add this advice. I want to give you this advice. That would be breaking the seal of confession. The priest could never do that, even though no one else is around. And, as you know, the priest cannot in any way, by his behavior or countenance, express that he knew something in confession. And of course, the famous story about that in this country was a priest that was killed at the communion veil, sadly, in Denver, Colorado, in I think around 1900. True story. And the priest, a man went into the confessional, and he told the priest, and he started like he was going to make his confession. And he told the priest, when you come out on the altar during Mass and you come for communion, I've got a gun on you. And the man walked out, and he did that. That actually happened. So the priest, after he finished confessions, went into the sacristy, rested for Mass, went out, had Mass as normal. Because if he didn't have Mass, he would be using knowledge from the confessional to change his behavior or what he was going to do. So he couldn't, couldn't not have Mass. And in fact, the only way we know the story is because the, obviously the man is arrested and he confessed and explained that he made that bad confession and told the priest in the confession. So, you know, it, it should be a consoling thought to realize that the priest is so strictly bound 
by the seal of confession, never to reveal anything that has been confessed to him. Um, last thing it mentions here, uh, okay. uh, last thing it mentions in here is the pens. So why don't we end with that? We'll, we'll go into that a little more because that leads into what's not on the board here. The fifth thing, I, I use the term satisfaction, which means atonement. That's why the priest gives us a penance at the end of confession to help us atone for the temporal punishment due to sin. And so there's obviously a strict obligation to fulfill that penance. But we'll take up with that next class and then go into what we mean by temporal punishment and also the Thank you, Father. Thank you. Joseph?